Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina and welcome to my lecture on hyperandrogenism and androgen excess. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. Reference for this lecture is Comprehensive Gynecology 7th edition, Chapter 40, Hyperandrogenism and Androgen Excess. This is the outline of my lecture. First, we review a little bit about the pilosebaceous unit and uh, do also a review on the physiology of androgens in women and then tackle causes of hyperandrogenism and its treatment. So for the review of the pilosebaceous unit or the PSU, the PSU is composed of a sebaceous component and a pillary component from which the hair shaft arises. Abnormalities of the sebaceous component lead to acne and abnormalities of the pillory unit lead to excessive growth, that's hirsutism, or excessive shedding, or alopecia. Basically, there are two types of hair. The vellus hair is soft, fine, and unpigmented, while the terminal hair is coarse, thick, pigmented, and undergoes cyclic changes. Anagen is the growth phase of the hair. It is followed by the transitional catagen phase, and finally by a resting or telogen phase after which the hair sheds. Androgen is necessary to produce development of terminal hair. The duration of anagen also determines the length of the hair, which varies in different parts of the body. For facial hair, it is approximately 4 months, which has implications for the treatment of facial hair hirsutism. Later on during this lecture, you will know that. There are several steroidogenic enzymes in the hair follicle, but the activity level of the enzyme 5-alpha reductase most directly influences the degree of androgenic effect on hair growth. With elevated levels of circulating androgen or increased activity of the 5-alpha reductase, terminal hair appears where normally only vellus hair is present. With these alterations, the length of the anagen phase is prolonged and the hair becomes thicker. Excessive 5-alpha reductase activity also may lead to acne as well as scalp hair loss or alopecia. The presence of hirsutism without the other signs of virilization is associated with a milder increase in androgenic activity compared to what is observed with virilization and it has a longer, more gradual onset. In the milder forms of hirsutism, hair is found only on the upper lip and chin. Severe hirsutism involves hair growth on the cheeks, chest or intermammary space, abdomen, which is superior to the umbilicus, inner aspects of the thighs, lower back, and intergluteal areas. The severity of the hirsutism can be roughly quantified by using a modified scoring system of the Ferryman Galloway or what we call the MFG scoring system. Now, this is an example of the modified Ferryman-Galloway scoring or MFG scoring system that we use for hirsutism. This is also the same scoring system that I already introduced to you in my PCOS lecture. So, the cutoff here usually is around 6 to 8. So as I've said, a score greater than 6 or 8 has generally been considered to be consistent with hirsutism. However, among Asian women, the threshold or cutoff for an abnormal score is much lower, usually at 3. So let us define the terms hypertrichosis and virilization. And because these are two terms that are very much related to the term hyperandrogenism. Now, increased hair growth only on the extremities or in isolated areas is called hypertrichosis and should not be confused with hirsutism. Virilization is a relatively uncommon clinical finding and its presence is usually associated with markedly elevated levels of circulating testosterone. The signs of virilization usually occur a relatively, over a relatively short period and these signs are caused by the masculinizing and the feminizing actions of testosterone and these signs include temporal balding, clitoral hypertrophy, decreased breast size, dryness of the vagina, and increased muscle mass. So now let's talk about the physiology of androgens in women. Major androgen produced by the ovaries is testosterone. The other androgens secreted by the ovary are androstenedione and DHEA. 
The major androgen produced by the adrenal glands, on the other hand, is DHEAS or dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate. The other androgens that are produced by the adrenal glands are androsinione and DHEA. Normal adrenal glands secretes little testosterone. Conversion of androsinione and DHEA to testosterone occurs in peripheral tissues. Androsinione and DHEA do not have strong androgenic activity but are peripherally converted at a slow rate to the biologically active androgen, which is testosterone. Only approximately 5% of androstenedione and a smaller percentage of DHEA are converted to testosterone. The total daily production of testosterone in women is normally approximately 0.35 mg. Most testosterone in the circulation is tightly bound to sex hormone binding globulin and is believed to be biologically inactive. An additional 10% to 15% is loosely bound to albumin, with only approximately 1% to 2% not bound to any protein, and this is what we call the free testosterone. Both the free and albumin-bound testosterone, or the unbound testosterone, are biologically active. To exert the biologic effect, Testosterone is metabolized peripherally in target tissues to the more potent androgen 5-alpha-dihydrotestosterone or DHT by the enzyme 5-alpha reductase. 5-alpha reductase activity is important for testosterone action peripherally or in the pilosebaceous unit as well as in the genitalia. 5-alpha understain 3-alpha 17-beta diol glucuronide or 3-alpha diol G is a stable, irreversible product of the intracellular 5-alpha reductase activity and reflects this activity in the blood. Even with normal circulatory levels of androgen, increased 5-alpha reductase activity in the PSU results in increased androgenic activity, thereby producing hirsutism. The degree of 5-alpha reductase activity can be measured in skin biopsies. If necessary for diagnostic reasons, 3-alpha-diol-G levels can be directly measured in the serum. Measurement of this metabolite is the most accurate indicator of the degree of peripheral androgen metabolism among women. Now this diagram shows to us the influence of androgen substrate and 5-alpha-reductase activity on the local production of biologically active androgens. So see here, if we have normal testosterone levels with a, coupled with a normal 5-alpha reductase, then we have normal DHT levels. If we have normal testosterone levels, but there's increased 5-alpha reductase activity, then we have increased levels of DHT. So that will also produce a hirsutism. If we have increased levels of testosterone, even with a normal 5-alpha reductase, that will also lead to an increased DHT activity, leading again to hirsutism or hyperandrogenic uh, signs. This table shows to us the markers of androgen production per source. It means that if the testosterone levels are very high in the bloodstream, then most likely the source of androgen production is the ovary. If the DHEAS levels are high, then most likely the androgen production source would be the adrenal gland. And lastly, if there is elevated levels of 3-alpha-diol-G, then most likely the source of androgen production is the peripheral tissues. So this is a table showing to us a differential diagnosis of hirsutism and virilization. Basically, these are the causes of the androgen excess or hyperandrogenism among women. So let us tackle some of these in the next few slides. So first, let's talk about idiopathic hirsutism or the peripheral disorder of androgen metabolism. Idiopathic hirsutism is diagnosed when there are signs of hirsutism and regular menstrual cycles in conjunction with normal circulating levels of androgen, both uh, testosterone and DHEAS. Because this type of disorder is frequently present in several individuals in the same family, particularly those of Mediterranean descent, it has also been called familial or constitutional hirsutism. Because neither ovarian nor adrenal androgen production is increased, the cause of the androgen excess has been called idiopathic hirsutism. 
Several studies have been done where it has been documented that some women so diagnosed have subtle increases in androgen production and metabolism. However, the more important way to characterize this disorder where androgens are normal or very slightly increased is that there is an enhancement of androgen action in the PSU. Women have increased levels of free alpha diol G, indirectly indicating that the cause of hirsutism is largely the result of increased 5-alpha reductase activity, and idiopathic hirsutism is actually a disorder of the peripheral compartment and is possibly genetically determined, although it is also possible that early exposure to androgens can program increase in 5-alpha reductase activity. So next is polycystic ovary syndrome. So we already tackled this topic in a separate lecture, so I recommend that you please go through that lecture again. So for this the purpose of this uh, lecture on hyperandrogenism, we'll just tackle a little bit about PCOS. So as I've mentioned in my lecture on PCOS, the criteria that we use for diagnosing PCOS is the Rotterdam criteria. Okay, so these are three criteria and you have to fulfill two out of the three to be able to diagnose PCOS. Of course, uh, it is required that we have to exclude other underlying hormonal disorders or tumors before we diagnose a patient with PCOS. Serum testosterone levels usually range from 0.7 to 1.2 nanograms per ml, and androstenedione levels are usually from 3 to 5 nanograms per ml. In addition, approximately 50% of women with this syndrome or with PCOS have elevated levels of DHEAS, suggesting um, an adrenal androgen involvement in women with PCOS. However, in uh, some race, the prevalence of this putative adrenal involvement is even lower. Evidence also exists for adrenal hyperactivity to stimulation in at least one-third of women with PCOS. Because of the hyperandrogenic state and the frequent hyperinsulinemia and overweight status among PCOS patients, sex hormone binding globulin or SHBG is decreased, leading to an increase in the unbound fraction of testosterone thus heightening the androgenicity. Now, although almost all women with PCOS have elevated levels of circulating androgens, the presence or absence of hirsutism depends on whether those androgens are converted peripherally by 5-alpha reductase to the more potent androgen, which is DHT. Now, as reflected by increased circulating levels of 3-alpha diol-G. non hirsut women with PCOS have elevated circulatory levels of testosterone, unbound testosterone, or DHAS, but not 3-alpha-diol-G. The third cause of hyperandrogenism or androgen excess is functional or idiopathic hyperandrogenism. This is diagnosed when androgens are elevated either uh, from an ovarian or adrenal source and menstrual cycles are regular and ovulatory. There's also no evidence on ultrasound for polycystic ovaries making this an idiopathic state. This can be a variant of PCOS in which women may be ovulatory. Next is stromal hyperthicosis. This is an uncommon benign ovarian disorder in which the ovaries are typically bilaterally enlarged to approximately 5 to 7 centimeters in diameter. Um, histologically, there are nests of luteinized theca cells within the stroma, and the capsules of these ovaries are thick, similar to those found in PCOS, but unlike PCOS, the subcapsular cysts are uncommon. The theca cells produce large amounts of testosterone, and like PCOS, this, is, this disorder has a gradual onset and is initially associated with an ovulation or amenorrhea and hirsutism. However, unlike PCOS, with increasing age, the ovaries secrete steadily increasing amounts of testosterone. The diagnosis of stromal hyperthicosis or ovarian stromal hyperthicosis should be suspected for women with uh, these signs and testosterone levels greater than 1.5 nanograms per ml. Next is the androgen-producing tumors. 
And specifically, we tackle the ovarian neoplasms and the adrenal tumors. Masculinizing ovarian or adrenal tumors are associated with rapidly progressive signs of hirsutism and virilization. Now, for ovarian neoplasms, the excess testosterone may be produced by benign and malignant cyst adenomas, Brenner tumors, Krukenberg tumors, germ cell tumors such as Sertoli-Leydig cell tumors and Hydro cell tumors, lipoid cell or adrenal res granulosa theca cell tumors. Androgen-producing ovarian tumors usually produce rapidly progressive signs of realization as mentioned in the previous slide. And uh, Sertoli-Leydig cell tumors develop during the reproductive years. And by the time they produce detectable signs of androgen excess, the tumor is almost always palpable during bimanual examination. The high low cell tumors, on the other hand, usually occur after menopause and uh, they are usually small and not palpable during examination. However, the history of rapid development of signs of realization and the presence of markedly elevated levels of testosterone, usually more than 2.5 times the upper limit of normal, with normal levels of DHAAS, usually facilitate the diagnosis of a high low cell tumor. Now, the adrenal tumors, almost all the androgen-producing adrenal tumors are adenomas or carcinomas that generate large amounts of C19 steroids normally produced by the adrenal gland, and these are the DHAAS, DHEA, and, and, and androstenedione. These tumors do not usually secrete testosterone directly, and uh, there is markedly elevated serum levels of DHEAS. Women should undergo CT scan or MRI of the adrenal glands to confirm this diagnosis of adrenal tumors. And adrenal adenomas secrete large amounts of testosterone because adrenal adenomas also secrete DHEAS. An adrenal adenoma is highly likely when DHEAS levels are greater than 8 micrograms per ml and testosterone levels are more than 1.5 nanograms per ml. Serum testosterone levels higher than 2 nanograms per ml with normal DHEAS levels indicate the probable presence of an ovarian tumor, and the diagnosis can be confirmed by, by manual pelvic exam and ultrasound or CT scan and MRI. Women with a rapid progression of virilization and DHEAS levels greater than 8 micrograms per ml most likely have an androgen-producing adrenal adenoma. CT or MRI can confirm this diagnosis. A long history of gradually increasing hirsutism, even if accompanied by virilization, is not consistent with the diagnosis of adrenal or ovarian tumors. Next, we have late-onset 21-hydroxylase deficiency or LOHD. This is an inherited disorder caused by the enzymatic defect, usually 21-hydroxylase uh, or less often 11-beta-hydroxylase and then this results in decreased cortisol biosynthesis. As a consequence, adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH secretion increases and adrenal cortisol precursors produced proximal to the enzymatic block accumulate and these are converted mainly to the 17-hydroxyprogesterone and androstenedione. Androstenedione, in turn, is converted to, to testosterone, which produces signs of androgen excess. The classic severe form, or the complete block, usually becomes clinically apparent uh, during fetal life by producing musculinization of the fetal female external genitalia. The severe form of CAH is the most common cause of sexual ambiguity in the newborn. The mild block of 21-hydroxylase activity usually does not produce the physical signs associated with increased androgen production until after puberty. And this is known as the late-onset 21-hydroxylase deficiency or LOHD or the late-onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia or LOCAH. And this is associated with the development of signs of hyperandrogenism in a woman in the second or third decade of life. Both classic CAH and LOCAH are transmitted in an autosomal recessive manner at the CYP21B locus and are linked to the HLA-B locus.
LOCH or late onset CH is usually associated with menstrual irregularity. The increased levels of androgen lower the SHBG levels, thus increasing the amount of biologically active circulating estradiol. The increased estradiol stimulates the tonic LH release, which increases ovarian androgen production and locally inhibits follicular growth and ovulation. Thus, women with this disorder present with postpubertal onset of hirsutism and oligomenorrhea or omenorrhea, similar to women with PCOS. Women with LOCAH, unlike those with PCOS, commonly have a history of prepubertal accelerated growth with later decreased growth in a short ultimate height. A history of this growth pattern, a family history of postpubertal onset of hirsutism, and findings of mild virilization are indicators of the presence of LOCAH. To differentiate LOCAH from PCOS, measurement of basal or the early morning serum 17-hydroxyprogesterone levels should be performed. If basal levels are greater than 8 nanograms per ml, then the diagnosis of LOCAH is established. If 17-hydroxyprogesterone is above normal but less than 8 nanograms per ml, an ACTH stimulation test should be performed. A baseline 17 OHP level should be measured and 0.25 mg of synthetic ACTH infused as a single bolus. One hour later, another serum sample of 17 OHP should be measured. If the level increases more than 10 nanograms per ml, then the diagnosis of LOCH is established. Corticosteroid Treatment is normally reserved for patients wishing to conceive to restore ovulatory function. It is important to measure 11 desoxycortisol during the ACTH stimulation when the diagnosis is being evaluated because of the possibility of 11 hydroxylase deficiency. This disorder is much more rare, but it also has an incomplete adult form and may also be associated with hypertension. Women with this incomplete form also have increases in 17 OHP and thus require the measurement of 11 desoxycortisol to differentiate it from 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Now, please take note PCOS, LOHD, idiopathic hirsutism, or those women diagnosed with functional hyperandrogenism may be associated with a very similar uh, history and findings at physical exam. Women with o LOHD, commonly have a family history of androgen excess and often belong to an ethnic group with a higher gene frequency for the abnormality. The diagnosis of LOHD is established by measurement of 17-OHP, that's 17-hydroxyprogesterone, either by testing for an early morning serum sample or following ACTH stimulation. Next, we have Cushing syndrome, and this is due to an excessive adrenal production of glucocorticoids caused by increased ACTH secretion or adrenal tumors. This syndrome manifests with hirsutism and menstrual irregularity in addition to the classic findings of central obesity, dorsal neck fat pads, abdominal striae, and muscle wasting and weakness. The latter catabolic effect of glucocorticoid excess differs from the anabolic effects of testosterone excess, but some women with PCOS may have other clinical findings similar to those found with Cushing syndrome. Women with Cushing syndrome are more likely to present with other symptoms and signs of glucocorticoid excess rather than because of hirsutism, but this has been found to occur in fewer than 1% of cases. Cushing syndrome can be easily excluded by performing an overnight dexamethasone suppression test or DSD. So how do we do this? So a 1 mg of dexamethasone is ingested at 11 p.m. and the plasma cortisol level is measured the following morning at around 8 p.m. If the cortisol level is less than 5 micrograms per 100 ml, then Cushing syndrome is ruled out. If the cortisol level is more than 5 micrograms per 100 ml, it is necessary to perform a complete dexamethasone suppression test or the Lidl test or measure the urinary free cortisol and plasma ACTH levels to determine whether Cushing syndrome exists. However, many endocrinologists prefer doing a 24-hour urinary free cortisol level or salivary cortisol. In doing this, a creatinine level is also measured to gauge completeness of the urine collection. 
Values above 100 micrograms per 24 hours in urine are abnormal. Values greater than 240 micrograms are almost diagnostic of Cushing syndrome. Late night salivary cortisol is now considered to be the most accurate method and samples are usually obtained on two separate nights. So values more than 0.4 micrograms per deciliter are diagnostic of a Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome may result from a pituitary tumor producing ACTH, an ectopic tumor in the body, and adrenal neoplasms or hyperplasia. So what are the general laboratory workups for hyperandrogenism? The laboratory workup for hyperandrogenism should include testosterone, the unbound testosterone or the free androgen index, the HAAS, and 17-hydroxyprogesterone when LOCAH is suspected, especially in the background of um, individuals who are very young, family history of androgen excess, and individuals belonging to high prevalent ethnic groups. So now for this last part, we tackle the treatment of hyperandrogenism. So first, the ovarian and adrenal tumors. As I've uh, mentioned uh, a few slides back, ovarian and adrenal tumors are best identified using high-grade imaging techniques. Almost all sertoliladic cell tumors are unilateral, so if the woman has not completed her family and these tumors are well differentiated and confined only to one ovary, then the tumors may be treated by a surgery using a unilateral salpingo-ophorectomy. On the other hand, because most hyalus cell tumors occur after menopause, they are best treated by bilateral salpingo-ophorectomy and total abdominal hysterectomy. Adrenal adenomas and carcinomas should also be treated by operative removal. Adrenal carcinomas frequently have metastasized to the liver by the time the androgenic signs have developed. And despite chemotherapy, the prognosis is poor after metastasis have occurred. Next is stromal hyperthicosis. This is best treated by bilateral salpingo-ophorectomy. After removal of the ovaries of women with stromal hyperthicosis or any of the androgen-producing tumors, the acne and oiliness of the skin disappear, breast size increases, and clitoral size decreases. The excess central hair becomes finer and grows less rapidly but does not disappear. Electrolysis or laser treatment can remove the body hair more effectively. For the late onset 21 hydroxylase deficiency, the treatment of women depends on their primary complaint. So androgen excess and menstrual irregularity can be treated as in uh, women with PCOS, usually with an oral contraceptives. Now, if uh, women uh, wish to conceive, it is preferable to use glucocorticoids such as hydrocortisone, prednisone, or dexamethasone in divided doses. Doses as low as 2.5 mg of prednisone or 0.25 mg dexamethasone may be used initially. The aim of treatment is to suppress androstenedione and bring the 17-OHP or 17-hydroxyprogesterone and progesterone levels into the normal range and ovulation usually resumes rapidly once uh, normal levels are achieved. Next is PCOS. A successful strategy usually requires an antiandrogen added to suppression therapy. And usually this suppression therapy comes in the form of uh, oral contraceptive pills. Among the various preparations, it would seem logical, of course, to use a less androgenic progestogen when using the oral contraceptive pills. And this less androgenic progestogen are usually norgestimate, desogestrel, drospirinone, um, then using OCPs that contain levonorgestrel, which is highly androgenic. In women with more significant complaints and findings, we can use antiandrogens. It is important to use antiandrogens in conjunction with an OCP because of the concern of exposure during pregnancy. Usually, antiandrogens are teratogenic. Oral contraceptives suppress ovarian androgens by inhibiting LH stimulation of the ovary. Oral contraceptives decrease also the adrenal androgens or the HAAS by about 30% and inhibit 5-alpha reductase activity. The ethanol estradiol component in oral contraceptives increases SHBG which results in lower free or unbound testosterone. 
As for the anti-androgens, these include androgen receptor blockers such as pyronaloctone and flutamide and a 5-alpha-2 inhibitor which is finasteride. Cyproterone acetate is also a, a good anti-androgenic uh, progestin and this is usually found uh, in combination with ethanol estradiol as an oral contraceptive. Drospirinone uh, in the doses used in contraceptives does not have appreciable anti-androgenic activity. Spironolactone uh, decreases ovarian testosterone production and inhibits 5-alpha reductase activity. And usually, it's given uh, at a dose of 200 mg per day for 3 months. Flutamide is also an anti-androgen and a major concern here is hepatotoxicity which can lead to death. And lastly, we have finasteride, which is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Finasteride is, finasteride is used currently as a second-line treatment when there are side effects or problems with using spironolactone. So other agents for treatment include the following. GnRH agonist with estrogen or an OC adback has been shown to be successful. However, this regimen is very expensive. And also, uh, because of the menopausal symptoms, uh, GnRH cannot be used for long-term therapy. Ketoconazole is also an option because this blocks adrenal and gonadal steroidogenesis by inhibiting cytochrome P450 dependent enzyme pathways. You can give this at a dose of 200 mg twice daily to treat hyperandrogenism associated with PCOS in idiopathic hirsutism. Glucocorticoids suppress the adrenal gland in women who have adrenal and androgen excess and low doses have been used with some degree of success. Because of its potential for serious side effects, glucocorticoids are not recommended for treating androgen excess but may be considered as an adjunct to ovulation induction in some women with PCOS. Insulin sensitizers such as metformin have been proposed as agents to treat androgen excess and have been used in women with PCOS. However, this is not recommended as a primary therapy for manifestations of androgen excess. We can also use eflornithine cream, 13.9%, and this is a topical treatment that has been approved by the US FDA for facial hirsutism. Eflornithine is an inhibitor of ornithine decarboxylase, which is an enzyme necessary for the growth and development of the hair follicle. Now, how do we follow up for the treatment of hirsutism? Because of the length of the hair growth cycle, responses to treatment should not be expected to occur within the first three months of therapy. And usually, we see significant results uh, after about six months uh, of treatment. Objective methods of assessing changes of hair growth such as photographs will be very, very useful. With the use of various therapies, a successful response for hirsutism should occur in approximately 70% of women within one year of therapy. Remaining excess hair can be removed either by electro electrolysis or laser techniques. Treatment should be continued for three years and then stopped to determine whether hirsutism recurs. If so, then therapy can be reinitiated. So, what are the hair removal techniques that we can do for patients with hirsutism? Cosmetic measures can be used as a primary treatment for mild isolated hirsutism or should be initiated after adequate suppressive therapy to remove unwanted hair once the growth rate has been inhibited by therapy. Definitive therapies include the use of electrolysis and lasers. Electrolysis uses uh, electrical energy through a wire electrode and destruction of the hair follicles results in its permanent removal. Photoepilation uses lasers that apply heat to pigmented hair follicles. Now, how do we manage acne? as a manifestation of hyperandrogenism. Among hyperandrogenic disorders, acne vulgaris is the disorder that is most successfully treated. And androgen stimulate stebum production and high doses of estrogen can inhibit es uh, androgen production and thereby um, inhibit also sebum production. Among women who present with acne, 52% can be found to have androgen excess with increases in unbound testosterone being the most frequently encountered. 
women who present with significant acne, particularly if they have not responded to routine dermatologic measures, an evaluation of androgen excess is warranted. An enhancement of 5-alpha reductase, mostly type 1, is a large part of the androgen abnormalities in acne. Treatment is usually with combination oral contraceptives. Uh, OCPs containing less androgenic progestogens are preferred, such as those progestogens that we already mentioned in the previous slides. If oral contraceptives alone are not completely successful, as with hirsutism, then the addition of antiandrogens would be most beneficial. How about alopecia? So, this is previously called androgenic alopecia. Now, the preferred term that we can use is female pattern hair loss or FPHL. This may or may not be associated with androgen excess. And with androgen excess, exaggerated 5-alpha reductase activity has been implicated in women with alopecia. Hair loss is usually on the frontal scalp and vertex with relative sparing of the occipital scalp. Anti-androgen therapy is the mainstay of treatment of alopecia. Now, in women, spironolactone and flutamide uh, are very effective. However, finasteride uh, is not effective in women. Minoxidil is also used to stimulate uh, hair growth. So, in summary, we have reviewed a little bit about pilosebaceous unit, also reviewed the physiology of androgens in women, and discuss the causes and treatment of hyperandrogenism. Thank you for watching this video and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and WordPress site. Thank you!